Welcome. How is everybody? Good afternoon. Oh, man. Really? I like that. Hey. Have you guys been walking around a lot? Yeah. So are you happy to be seating? All right. Are you happy to be here and sitting? Woo look, look, Helen, lots of people. My name's Holly Furfer, so happy to have you here. Happy New Year, by the way. And what a better way to start the new year than with new food, new ideas, and especially Helen Chen, who is phenomenal. Now, how many people are sushi fans? How many people make sushi at home? Oh, we're gonna change all that, aren't we, Helen? Yes. Okay, first of all, tell us about Helen's Asian Kitchen. It's brilliant. Well, it's a brand new line. Well, it's not brand new, but it's a full line of Asian cooking, cookware, and accessories. And it's all distributed through Harold Import, that is the, uh, the exclusive distributor. And I have put, put it together, created the product. Some of them are my invention, so there's just one of a kind. And um, I think, uh, you know, for... Asian cooking, whether it's Thai or Chinese or Japanese, there's so much interest, but a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation. And we're hoping that through Helen's Asian Kitchen, through our cookbooks and our cookware, the website, blogs, that we can really help to educate uh, Americans on the proper way to enjoy and cook Asian food. So now, you know, I think all of us are a little concerned, I won't say frightened, but, all right, let's be real, frightened, scared to death of making sushi at home. But you're saying we can do it, it's not that scary. It's very, very simple. And uh, we have a kit that will show you how to make three different sizes and shapes. But the important thing is I think a lot of people think sushi is just raw fish. And they're concerned about their, where to get the raw fish, if it's the right one, how to store it, how to keep it. But actually, the maki sushi, which is the rolled sushi, which is what we're going to be doing today, traditionally has no raw fish in it. It Ooh. is a vegetarian. Very nice. Okay. And for the record, just so you know, Harold Imports, just down the hall on the left-hand side. So afterwards, if you want to talk to Helen or see any of the products here and see her line, uh, please check out Harold Imports down that way. Now, I'm going to let you get started. I'll be in the audience, and Helen has been so gracious to allow us to ask questions. So if you have questions about any of her products, her cookbook, any techniques, Asian cuisine, anything really, Helen yeah. will answer it. So Let's ladies and gentlemen, Helen Chen. Thank you. Well, this is your opportunity. No, uh, a lot of people don't have a place to ask questions about Asian cooking, so it doesn't have to be about sushi. But if you do have a question on something, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, as I said, sushi is often misunderstood because people confuse it with just strictly raw fish. But the word sushi actually refers to the rice. Sushi means vinegared rice. So rice is the heart of sushi. Without rice, there is no sushi. That's it. So if anything, the rice is the most important ingredient. And as I said, most of these rolled sushi, which is called maki sushi, M-A-K-I, that's the roll type where the nori is either on the outside or the inside, these roll sushi most often contain vegetables and cooked seafood. So it could be crab or it could be shrimp, but most of it is actually not raw fish. And if they do use raw fish, it's often the little scraps that are left over after they make the more expensive nigiri sushi, where they have little pieces of fish left over, they may chop that up and then use that in a rolled sushi, but in most cases, the rolled sushi is vegetarian, really. And because it's that way, it is a very, very healthy way to eat. There is usually not a single drop of oil at all. We're using white rice today, but you can also do it with short grain brown rice if you want. So the important, since the heart of sushi is the rice, I wanted to show you how we prepare the rice because that is so critical. The rolling is fun, the making of it is fun, but if you don't know and don't understand the rice, then you really can't make sushi. So the first thing is the rice that we use is always a Japanese style rice. And if it has a Japanese sounding name, or if it says sushi rice, or it says it's short or medium grain rice, 
that is the correct one to use. You should never use long grain rice, basmati rice, jasmine rice. Those are all wrong because they are not sticky enough and they will not stick together. So all your sushi will just fall apart. So you have to use the correct type of rice. Um, and this is the one that we've been using. The rice is cooked in a pot that I actually invented. And it's sitting in here. And I want to show you what we're going to do to season the rice. Before I get that out, I'll just show you the ingredients. Of course, it's the rice cooked with water. No salt, nothing added but water. And we are going to season it with a seasoned rice vinegar that you can buy in the market. Now, you can make your own rice seasoning, and many sushi chefs have their own type of, of uh, seasoning, so they have their own recipe. And many of them don't even want to divulge it to other people because it's secret. But basically, it is rice vinegar, and it must be rice vinegar. You cannot use cider vinegar or distilled vinegar because those vinegars are very acidic, and they don't, they would be too strong for sushi. So it must be rice vinegar, and then salt and sugar. Those are three ingredients. And some chefs maybe add a little bit of lemon juice. But buying the seasoned vinegar eliminates the need to mix your own, because this is seasoned with salt and sugar. So it's all done. And you may be familiar with this. A lot of people have used this for making uh, salad dressing or things like that. But this is actually the vinegar used to uh, flavor the sushi rice. And by the way, sushi actually did not originate in Japan. It originated in China, which is a surprise to a lot of people because sushi is so I iconic to Japan. But in fact, it started in the southern part of China, and it was used as a way, the vinegar rice was used to help keep fish and seafood from spoiling. And they used to then store the fish that way and then throw away the rice. But then they realized that this vinegared rice actually had a nice flavor, and they began to use it. This style of cooking went to Japan and actually never did return to China. So the Chinese do not make sushi. The Koreans make sushi is slightly different. The Japanese, but the Chinese, although it originated in China, no longer make sushi. It's just one of those, those uh, uh, culinary things that just never took hold. So we need to have the rice cooked, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But you need to have the, the implements ready to prepare the rice, which is seasoning the rice. The seasoning has to be put into the rice when the rice is hot. You cannot cook rice, let it cool, and then season it later. The reason is, when the rice, cooked rice, begins to cool, it forms a hard shell. And the hard shell is the starch. And when the starch begins to be uh, firm, it no longer has the ability to absorb the vinegar anymore. So you'll have a puddle of vinegar on the bottom. So if your rice is cold, reheat it in a steamer, or the way I'm doing it here, or in the microwave. So the rice has to be hot, or at least very warm. But the trick is, you mix the seasoning in, and then the rice has to be cooled very quickly. Even though you had it cool, it has to be hot when you start, then you have to cool it right away. And we're cooling it right away by fanning. So you can use a personal electric fan if you're by yourself, or I'm going to have a, a, an assistant come over and fan the rice as I'm mixing it. And the idea there is that as the rice begins to cool, it is then, again, um, having more difficulty absorbing the vinegar. So we want to do that quickly, but we also want to cool the rice so we get that nice gloss and sticky quality. And sushi was always made with rice that is approximately room temperature or body temperature. So it's not hot, it's not cold, but it is about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, we have actually a small window. So now, what I have in here is Helen's Asian Kitchen, the perfect rice cooker. And this is an invention of mine, how to cook rice. 
and it looks very different from anything else. It has a bamboo handle, and it looks a little bit like a really nice ice bucket. <laughs> but what you do is we put rice and water into this cooker, put this whole thing with the bamboo handle but without its lid into a stock pot with a little bit of water, about two inches, and we cover the stock pot and we steam the rice. That is in here is what we call a bain-marie. That's what a bain-marie is. It's not really a steamer, it's a bain-marie. And what happens is the steam cooks the rice and the rice will never burn. It will never boil over, it will never scorch, never overcook and never dry out. Even if you cooked it longer than necessary. For instance, this rice will take 20 to 25 minutes to cook. If you cooked it for two hours, it will still be perfect. It just will not happen. Now, of course, with this, if we're not making sushi, you can take this right to the table with its bale handle, with its lid, and now it's your serving piece. So it cooks, you serve from it, you can reheat in it, you can store in it, and if you're not using it to cook, it does make a dandy ice bucket. <laughs> and now, how many rice cookers can become an ice bucket, right? Okay, so now what we're going to do is we have the rice here that's hot and we need to put it into some kind of container that is non-reactive, which means no metal. Do not put it into a stainless steel bowl or aluminum bowl or anything. You can use like a nine by 13 baking pan that's glass, or you can use some, or it's like this. This is a perfect size right here, this size here. And we're going to take the rice and basically dump it all into this bowl. And I'm gonna to have to get my fanner up here fairly soon. <laughs> so all this goes into here. All right. And use, if you're using a bamboo rice paddle, moisten it with water, because the rice is going to become quite sticky. Now, Now what I'm going to do, before she starts to help me by fanning it, I'm going to pour, oh, about maybe a quarter cup into this rice. This rice is approximately three cups of rice. So I'm figuring about a quarter cup. Now as I'm stirring this, Erin here is going to be fanning it at the same time. Now, it really does make a difference. What happens is the fanning and the mixing of the rice is the rice is not very sticky now. It's going to get sticky. It helps to develop that stickiness. So this is actually fun. You know, I mean, it's, it's a very active kind of cooking. And, you know, you, you, you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to have a, a cooking experience to do this. <laughs> But when you're stirring it, you're basically folding in the seasoning, so you don't want to smash it or mash it. You need to basically use the flat of the paddle and fold it in. Now, if you like a stronger seasoning taste to it, just add a little bit more vinegar. But once the, vinegar, the uh, rice reaches that body temperature, you, it's too late to put anything more in because it's not going to be absorbed anymore. A question okay. for you, Helen. If you didn't have enough seasoning or flavor to it, could you reheat the rice and then you add could. more? Yes, you could put it into the microwave uh, and then reheat it. So we're going to put it aside. Thank you very much, Erin. All right, so well I'll done. just put she it here for now. One big right arm now. Uh, well isn't done. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Everyone needs a, it needs a fanner. Okay. And what I have here is some rice that's already done and is already cool. Now we're going to get ready to make the sushi, but... I want to go over to, with you the ingredients that go into sushi. Before, can I ask, does anybody have any questions about the rice for Helen before we move forward? No, did I cover okay. everything? Just checking. All okay, right. carry Great. on. Great. All right, now we have the rice ready, and the rice is continuing to cool. It probably needs a little bit more fanning, but you probably don't want to sit there and watch just someone fanning the rice. So we'll go to the next step, which is what goes into the sushi itself. And we have a number of things that we're going to use today. This is something that you probably do not recognize. And this is called campio. Campio is the bottle gourd. 
And this is a seasoned bottle gourd that actually comes in a can. It's all cooked and it's seasoned. Generally, it's a, it comes in strips and it is very pale beige color and it's not seasoned and you have to cook it. So, now it's nice to make sushi, but you don't want to have to go through a huge amount of work. So I like to use this because it does have a nice flavor to it. Um, and if you don't have it, don't worry about it. But when you taste it, you'll see that it has a nice flavor. And what's interesting about it as well is it is cut and sliced to be the exact length of a rolled sushi. So it is made for that. The other is crab. These are crab. Um, I have to explain this. Do you know what surimi is? Have you ever heard that word? Okay, this is surimi. Surimi is imitation crab. And this is always used in most Japanese restaurants. I had sushi two nights ago to warm myself up for this. And uh, they use this. Now, the interesting thing here again, it's made for sushi. This is seven inches, the exact length of a roll sushi, individually wrapped. But what really is surimi? Surimi is not crab. It tastes like crab. It is a white fish. It's usually pollock or um, haddock, different types of white fish that is cooked and washed to take out its natural flavor. Then, the crab flavor is put in with starch and often with wheat starch. So if someone is gluten intolerant, they probably should not have this, but use fresh lump crab meat instead. But this is very, very convenient. And they put a little bit of food coloring. This is used throughout Japan and in just about every Japanese restaurant in America. They come frozen, and as I said, it's already perfectly shaped and sized for sushi. Next is the cucumber. And the cucumber you should use is always the seedless or English cucumber because it is the one that does not have a lot of seeds. Now, all the ingredients that we're going to put into the sushi needs to be small, about the thickness of a pencil or a thick pencil. So if you keep that in mind, it's about the size of a pencil. So this is the size of the cucumber. And the way I do it basically is you can take your nori, which is the seaweed sheet. The nori is always seven by eight, always. So you take and measure the seven inches. You can take a ruler if you want. And you trim off one end. And then I just take it up here and measure. And this is about right. Now, I have the right length, all right? Because it's silly to cut it and have it the wrong length because you're always adjusting it. So if you're going to cut it, start off by doing it right. And cut it in half. And then cut it in quarter. And by the way, the knife I'm using is part of Helen's Asian Kitchen line and it's a Santoku knife. And the Santoku knife is a Japanese vegetable knife. And it can be used with sushi. It is very, very sharp and it's thin. For, make, for sushi, you need a thin blade. So you can't use a blade that's got a very thick, thick uh, blade to it. It's got to be one that's quite thin and very, very sharp. Then the next thing is, even though this is seedless, there are seeds here, but they are immature. So you need to remove them and just take the knife and just cut them off. So these are the seeds. It's tasteless, it's very watery. So we throw that away. Then we cut this again into that pencil thickness. So that's what you want. And you need to have things prepared in advance. You don't want to be suddenly looking for your cucumber and wanting to cut it. And the other thing that we use is ripe avocado. Now, many of the 
rolled sushi that's in the uh, US market today does not exist in Japan. Obviously, the California roll did not come from Tokyo, right? <laughs> Okay, so most of the rolls you see, the rainbow roll, the caterpillar roll, the dragon roll, all those wonderful ones, they had a Las Vegas roll. They did not come from Japan. The Japanese are very traditional. And all these new types of roll sushi originated in the West and mostly in the United States. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, am I doing, am I putting the right ingredients in? When you're doing some of the larger rolled sushi, which is called futamaki, you can put almost anything in it that you think might, might um, match. I'm also going to be using carrots. Now, the carrot is a little bit difficult to get in the right, not as much size, but texture. Because the sushi is tender, the rice is tender, but chewy. Now, the cucumber is crunchy, but not hard. The, the carrot is hard. It is too hard to use, just like this. So there are two things you can do. Number one, cook it. You boil it, or you can put it in the microwave until it's partially cooked, so it's not mushy, but it is tender and then cut it into that pencil shape. Or what I did was I used the Benriner, which is made in Japan, and I made these wonderful julienne sticks. Now what this is, is now because they're small, I can use them and put them into sushi, and when you eat them, you're not going to be assaulted with something that is really too hard, that does not match that texture that is in sushi. You know, sushi itself, in most Japanese food, is very cerebral. You know, it, it is, when you think of zen, when you think of, you know, beautiful things, the Japanese cuisine is that. And they certainly take into account all the details of making the dish. Uh, if anything, I would say that Japanese food is probably one of the most beautiful to look at. Absolutely. Much, I'm Chinese, and I, you know, what I'd like to say is, Chinese food tastes wonderful, but it won't pass a beauty contest. But Japanese food, you know, can be framed. But Chinese food, in general, I think tastes better. Uh, sorry, anybody here Japanese? Okay, so take a carrot like this. Now, this is what the Ben Reiner is. It's, it was invented in Japan, and it's used by sushi chefs, too, because Part of making sushi is not, you know, what we have here is very, very simple. But when you go to a sushi restaurant and you see the way they cut things, the people, the chefs that are apprenticed, they spend a year learning to cook rice. Then they spend the next year learning to cut. They don't make sushi for a long, long time. So what we're doing is we're taking that sort of shortcut by using appliances and accessories that allow us. So, what the Benriner is, and it's a wonderful, wonderful tool, is that it has a blade, a straight blade, and it has a place where you can put in different size shredding blades that will give you that long julienne. And the one I'm using is a medium, so you can see how really small that is. Because remember, for Asian cooking, we want small pieces. We're not making French fries. So we don't want anything big, thick, and bulky. We want them small, narrow, and delicate. Now, we would like to make this as long as we can. So you take the whole carrot and hold it down. This would be a 45 degree angle, so maybe we go it down to like a 25 degree angle. And we just start moving it across. And as we get further and further along, it's taking more of the carrot. You see now it's taking this much. And we end up with these wonderful strips. So that's how we're going to use the carrot. All right. And of course, the other thing that you can do, and I'm not going to take the time to actually do it right now because I want to get down to actually molding the sushi for you. But another ingredient would be eggs. And we also have what is known as the tamago pan. 
And this pan is especially designed for making Japanese omelets. And you can make a thin omelet, which is just like a sheet, and then you can cut it into strips so it looks like this. And you can use that as a filling. Or you can actually build an omelet so that you put the uh, egg in, and then you roll it, put some more egg, and you keep on rolling it until you get something that's about an inch thick. And that type of um, omelet is actually used on nigiri sushi. And you know nigiri sushi is what we call the finger sushi, which is this, a little finger of rice with fish or something on top. And of course, if you order a tamago, nigiri tamago, you're ordering the nigiri with the uh, omelet. All right, so now let's get down to actually making sushi itself. This is the set. Now, while I was uh, uh, using this back in the prep kitchen, it, uh, I heard uh, this woman say, oh, you know, I could never figure out how to use that mat. You know, and it, the rice gets stuck into it, and I'm rolling, and it doesn't work. Well, this set really takes all the guesswork out of it. And in fact, it's wonderful also for children because it's very hands-on and it's very, very easy. They can't do everything, you know, they, they may not be able to cut, but they certainly can do some of the other things. So there are three types of sushi that we can make. One is called the hoso maki. Hoso maki is the thin roll sushi, and I don't think we have a, let me see, I think we may have a sample of it right here. No, that's not. Okay, I think we have a sample there that um, Alinda is going to just un, un, uh, unwrap. And that is, the hosomaki is the very thin, about one inch thick sushi that contains one ingredient, only one thing. It could be a carrot, it could be the daikon radish, pickled daikon radish, but it's one. So here's a sample of what I'm talking about. These are the three that can be made with this kit. Hosomaki, and this has the um, cucumber in it. Futomaki, which is the center. Futomaki means fat roll. So this is the fat roll, and the fat roll can contain a numerous ingredients. And then this is strictly USA, the heart-shaped sushi, which is absolutely wonderful because, you know, What's coming up, Valentine's Day? What a wonderful thing to make for your loved one on their birthday or something like that. It's a lot of fun. So those are the three. I'm gonna put this over here. So let's start by making the first one, which is the hosomaki. Now, what I've done with these pieces is I've actually marked them A, B, C, D. And I was thinking, you could even number them, because if you have little children that are doing it, it's kind of nice to say, okay, you know, one goes on top of two, and then you use three, and, and this way, you know, they kind of get used to doing it. But even for adults, it kind of helps to remember, you know, what the parts are. Okay, now, maki or roll sushi always has nori, always. So this is a package of nori, a big package. You must always keep it dry and sealed as much as possible. And if it's in a uh, humid climate, this will begin to absorb the moisture from the air. So if that begins to happen, what you should do is take the nori, go to the stove, hold the nori with a pair of tongs, and run it quickly back and forth over either an open flame if you have gas, or over the electric burner and the heat from that will begin to dry it out. Because if you don't, it's going to be tough. So, the Helen, parts that we need for this, yes. Where can you buy that nori? Where can we find that? The nori is basically um, in Asian markets and there are a lot of supermarkets now that are carrying the rice, nori, soy sauce, the ginger, because so many people are looking to make sushi at home. So I think more and more you're going to find them in almost any good supermarket. So this is the nori. The nori is a um, sort of a, um, a blue-green algae. It's made of seaweed, and it is made into a very, very thin sheet. So when you take it out, you're going to notice lines 
here. If you just hold it back and forth in the light, you can see lines. Those lines are because this was dried on a bamboo mat. And when they removed it from the bamboo mat, the lines of the bamboo remained. Okay, now, for hosomaki, we only need half a sheet. So if it's nice and crisp, you can just fold it in half like a piece of paper. Like that. If it's not really crispy, it won't do that. So it's got to be nice and crisp. And you put the sheet you're not using back in the bag to be sure that it stays dry. Now we take the part that is used for the osomaki. There are two sides to nori, a shiny side and a matte side. This is the matte. This is the shiny. The shiny side down. It doesn't really matter if you didn't do it that way. You know, nothing is going to happen. But it's the more attractive side. And therefore, it will be uh, better looking. Then you take this piece, which I have marked F. <laughs> and we're actually going to put this with the, the teeth, the cuts, up on top of this piece. Then we take the nori and we slip it inside. Okay, so far so good. Then we're going to use this to tamp it down. Now, here's the part that is a little bit tricky. And this is handling the rice. This is the rice that's already cool. It is very, very sticky. You have to moisten your hands. If you do not moisten your hands, you will wear a glove of rice and that's it. It's all over you. And you must always have a wet cloth available. Wet cloth, bowl of water, cold water, your knife. Now, before you start, you dip your hands into the water. Do not put your whole hand in like the hands are going swimming, right? All you do is dip it up to the first knuckle, the first knuckle. Then, when you lift up your hands, you rub your hands, and you have now taken that water and spread it out. Then, using your fingertips, pick up the rice and place it into the slot here. Now, always have a wet towel available because sometimes it sticks to the tip of your finger. I find that it helps to actually use your fingers. This kit does come with a little spatula, but frankly speaking, I think it's better to use your fingers. At least I find that that's the best way. There. Now, we take wasabi. This is the Japanese horseradish. And you know this is not true wasabi. It never has been and never will be. True wasabi is extremely expensive and it's very difficult to grow. And there's one place in Oregon that grows fresh wasabi and they ship it to Japan. So if you can ever get fresh wasabi, the only way to prepare it is to use a little grinding board made with a piece of shark skin. It's very esoteric. This, so, is not wasabi. It has wasabi flavor. This is a horseradish. Well, wasabi is a horseradish, but this is not the wasabi. So, you know, when you're buying it, realize here again, 99% of all the restaurants use this, either in a powder form or pre-mixed in a paste. If you're mixing it from a powder form, it is... Um, two parts powder to one part water into a stiff paste, then it must sit for an hour, I mean, of 10 minutes before you can use it. And if you wait too long, the wasabi will lose its flavor. So you don't make too much. Make only what you need. So we just spread the wasabi, and then we're going to take the cucumber. Now, this should fit because I cut it to fit this. And lo and behold, it fits. So you just use your fingers and press down on the cucumber. Press it in. So I smeared on a little bit of wasabi. Now I need to moisten my fingers again. And I take some more of the rice. 
and I place it in to the trough again. Just to fill it in. Now, now I didn't press too hard. Now what we're going to do is fold the excess nori down. And take this part, which is the part that we use for tamping it, and press it down. Now this is forming it. You have to hold it down for a little while. In other words, what you're doing is not only compressing the rice, but you are moistening the nori. So if you don't moisten, be sure that the nori is absorbing some of the moisture from the rice, what is going to happen is the nori will unfold because that's, it, it, there's nothing holding it. Then take this out. Now what you can do is you can actually cut if you want, but what I like to do is actually take it out and, cut, and get it onto the cutting board. So that's the roll. Now, the roll needs to be cut. You can use these guides if you want, but personally I find it much easier to just cut. And one way to do it is always have that wet towel available have to moisten the knife. And the way to moisten it first is to dip the tip of the knife into the water and let a drop drip down the blade. And that is like enough water, but not too much. And then we're going to cut it in half first. And then you have to then wipe the blade after each cut. Because if you take a look at the knife, there is a residue of sticky rice. And if you don't, you're not going to be able to cut it anymore. So each time, and again, and what we have here, we're putting them on these little this is the end. The very end one, most of the time it's not served and you as a chef can eat it and enjoy it in the kitchen <laughs> before everyone else. And here's one way that um, can be used to serve it. We have a little bit of soy sauce here and the hosomaki is on the plate. So, then the next method is of course making the futomaki. And with the futomaki, be sure to clean your knife and all the little pieces of rice. We're using this piece. So this is a large one. And this goes just right on the cutting board. Then we take the nori again, but this time a full sheet, because this is going to be big. Shiny side down, place it into the mold. Then moisten your hands again and place the rice inside. The, the, uh, this kit comes with all the directions on how much rice to use, but as you do it you'll begin to realize and understand about how much rice you need for each. And be sure you get it down into the corners as well. And then we put a little bit of wasabi again. So take the wasabi tube, put a little bit on your finger, and smear it onto the rice. And this one, we're going to put in a number of ingredients. So we will use the crab. See how beautifully that fits in. Cucumber, campio, which is the bottle gourd,
And we'll put a little bit of uh, pickled ginger on this. This pickled ginger is a little different from the type that you may be used to. This is called uh, Beni Shoga, and it's a little bit more sour. Then moisten your hands again, put more rice in, and fill the top. Remember, you'll just always have to have that, your hands moistened, because if you don't, it, it just everything will stick. And be sure you get in the corners. Now remember, the corners are usually the areas where um, very often the sushi chef will cut it off. And they, actually, no one really eats it because that is not the attractive part of the sushi. It's the center. Now, we take the, the nori and we fold that down. And now, we take this portion. All right, remember when we started, we did this to make the hosomaki. Now we're using the same part, but we're using the flat part of the back. And we're going to press it. So the pressing, you have to really press it and wait a while to be sure that it is going to be formed. Does anybody have any questions for Helen up to this point? So far, no. Have I explained everything well? <laughs> you Good. make it seem so easy. OK. Now, uh, what we're going to do is remove it by just pulling this up. Now, you, again, you can use those guides if you want. Right? I personally don't. So that's the futomaki. So now, again, to cut that. And you know, it's just like a bartender. If you've ever bartended, I used to, I used to bartend. I don't drink, so I was always told that, I, that the best bartenders don't drink. <laughs> and uh, what you do is you always cut it in half first, and then you cut it into pieces. Never start at one end and go down, because you'll always end up wrong. So you cut down the center first. And that's our futomaki. And then, let's put this aside, and we'll do the last one, which is the Valentine sushi. OK, so now we're going to take this piece on the bottom, place this one, which was for the futomaki, on top. And this also takes a full sheet. So we take another sheet of nori. And Helen, if you don't, if you're not a wasabi person, you don't like anything that's spicy or hot. Leave it out. Is there something else you can use to sort of hold it together so it's not just vegetables and rice? If you don't like anything spicy, you can use mayonnaise. And in fact, mayonnaise mixed with a little bit of wasabi is actually very nice. So it's not too spicy, but it gives you a little bit of bite. And the best mayonnaise is actually the Japanese mayonnaise, which is a brand called Kewpie. And the bottle is a plastic bottle that looks like the old Kewpie doll. And it's, it's, a, very, it's a little bit sweeter and uh, a little bit thinner than the mayonnaise that we use in this country. But if you don't have to get that, what you can do is just mix it with um, uh, mayonnaise and some wasabi. And that will cut back on the amount of bite that gives you, but still have a little bit of flavor. Or you can use some car uh, uh, chili garlic sauce or a little bit of sweet sauce even mixed with the mayonnaise, and that could be sort of the, the part that holds everything together. All right, so now this is the full sheet, and it again goes sunny side, shiny side down. All right, get your fingers moist again. Take the rice, and we're placing it into the center. I think you can see how this is a, um, a method of making sushi that also could be a lot of fun if you were having a sushi party. Because it doesn't take a lot of experience to make this, but you can have a couple of these sets on hand 
and people can try their hand at making the different kinds of sushi with different ingredients and you prepare everything and have it at the table and then let them go at it and you know you give them some instructions about moistening their hands you have the rice all cooked and it could be a lot of fun so we'll we'll still use wasabi now wasabi the Japanese have a saying that um, if you eat too much wasabi, you're going to get stupid. <laughs> and it's probably because wasabi just goes straight through your sinuses. And sometimes it's just like, whoa, a little bit much. Okay, so let's do again a crab. Put that in. And we'll use some car carrots this time. And I still like the campio. It's one of my favorite. And since I already opened the can, I'm going to use it so that we don't have to discard this because it tastes so good. Campio. And we can put some um, avocado in this one too. So Helen, you know sometimes you'll see the uh, sushi where it doesn't have the nori on the outside? Uh, it's a roll sushi. It's called the inside out roll. That type cannot be made in this because it will stick. However, you probably, it, it needs a totally different technique. And you know what? I don't have enough time to explain <laughs> that to you. I'll just have to leave you hanging. Well, you know what? They can always talk to you afterwards. If you go down this aisle to the right, you know, straight forward down the right, uh -huh. on the left-hand side is Harold Imports. Will you be down there oh, so I'll they can there. ask? Oh, yes, yes. There you go. So you can yeah. always ask Helen. You and know, you have a cookbook, too. That's true, although it has nothing to do with sushi. But I think you need a sushi cookbook now. <laughs> what is your cookbook sushi about? Cookbook. That's you, true. Is your, your cookbook is about? It is Chinese cooking, and it is, I have one on Asian noodles, and it does have some Japanese recipes, and the other one is a stir fry. Okay, so there we go. Now we fold it down. Now we take this part, and you see the way this is designed. So we place, push that down, and now it's going to make that heart shape. And we need to kind of let it sit for a while. We have here a number of them already made. You see that? It's very pretty. Now, could something like this for retailers, could, could they easily make that sushi for display purposes so people can see exactly what they would get if they yeah, had the kit? Yeah, they could. And I would suggest, you know, just stay with vegetables. So don't do anything with any kind of fish because, you know, if you don't have proper refrigeration, even the crab, it might not be a good idea. So if you stick with vegetables, a cucumber, carrots, um, you know, things like that, I think they'll be pretty safe because the sushi rice can really stay un unrefrigerated for up to 12 hours. In fact, you should never refrigerate it. Never. The once you refrigerate sushi rice, it becomes cement. And that's it. Never, and that's one of the reasons why I never will buy sushi in a supermarket. It's who knows? It's been sitting in this cold, cold chiller box. No. So, uh, in fact, most Japanese uh, sort of look at that and go, why? You know. So, yeah, don't, don't refrigerate it. And because the vinegar also is sort of a preservative. So now, because this is that heart-shaped, I can't take it out and cut it because it will flatten it all. So now I will follow the cut marks. So one, and after each cut, you see all that, that starch on the rice, on the knife, that all is going to just drag on the sushi. Be sure your knife is nice and sharp. And this one. You know, it's interesting. In Japan, um, they, whenever we cook rice, and sushi rice is included, whether it's for sushi or for a meal, the rice is always washed, always in cold water. So what has happened in Japan is that so many people are eating rice and washing their rice, especially in restaurants. 
in a sushi restaurant here in the United States, one evening they probably would go through 20 pounds of raw rice. There's a lot of washing. Now after I cut, I'm going to just mold this again, just to be sure. And they have developed a rice called rinse-free rice. It's a totally new development that's beginning to show itself on the East Coast. It's been on the West Coast for about a year. And um, that type of rice does not need to be washed because they have found that there's so much starch going into the waterways that it is an environmental hazard. Who would have thought washing rice would become an environmental hazard? Okay. Now, lift this up. And there's our heart. So, we have the three shapes. Um, the, you can use a little bit of um, sesame seeds. And there's a wonderful um, sesame seed grinder here. So you can roast your own sesame seeds and then use this to put a little fresh ground sesame seed taste onto your sushi if you want to, or even use it when you're rolling it so that you fill it with a little bit of that sesame taste. And this is a, this is a, a wonderful new item. Um, and then when you're eating, we eat it with soy sauce. Now, you must remember the soy sauce is, should have a very brief encounter with the sushi. All right, don't, don't let it swim in it. A brief encounter. Now, and also, even though these are very large pieces, the small ones should be eaten in one bite. And usually nigiri sushi should always be eaten in one bite. Don't take a bite and put it down. They know you're not a sushi person if you do that, okay? The futamaki is very large. You could probably do it in two bites, but it's hard because it begin, once you start biting into it, it can begin to fall apart. So generally, you know, it's open wide and enjoy it. And a very brief encounter, and sometimes not even any soy sauce, because one of the things that are happening is we are now on that fight against sodium. Right, I mean, it was fat once. Now we did that war. The next war was on sugar. And we had that war, and now it's on sodium. So what I would suggest is if you do use soy sauce, use a small amount or maybe a low sodium soy. And there's a lot of flavor here because of the ingredients we put in. So uh, maybe cutting back on that uh, soy sauce might be a good idea. Um, I think you know, this shows you how really simple it is to make and how much fun it is. Uh, as I was making it really more and more, I think this, that this is in a way a family affair. You know, it's something that uh, the whole family can be involved in, uh, you know, cooking the rice and, and understanding also what sushi is and understanding cultural differences. I think that really helps, especially young people, to really appreciate the di different cultures that are in this world and to understand and appreciate them. So I want to thank you very much for being here. I know we're going to serve some for you, so thank you.